You might know our guest today from interviews with Bill Clinton, the Dalai Lama, or my personal favorite, Johan Cruyff. Despite our best efforts here at Room for Discussion, Tuan Huys is still the Dutch king of the interview. How does Tuan reflect on the changing media landscape? How does, this, how does he see the difference of that landscape between the US and the Netherlands? And who's the man behind the interview? Tuan Huys. Oh. Tuan Huys was a war reporter in Bosnia and later a correspondent in New York and Washington DC, where he later started Galicia Tour, where he interviewed many inspiring people in front of an audience of students. Beyond this, he was also the host of Beethoven, where he interviewed politicians to uh, get the truth behind the headlines. Without further ado, Tuan Huys. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello. Very impressive already. Yeah, we uh, research. I mean, it's uh, a lot of work. It's fun work <laughs> as well. So, uh, speaking of research, you always start your interviews with a question, which uh, we would love to ask you as a student right. on, a, on a scale of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. How were you? Um, uh, ooh. <laughs> Rock and roll was okay. Alcohol was uh, a drug, so not, not so much. More in my time, it was only, or let's say mostly alcohol. And I had a steady girlfriend already in my first year of uh, college. So um, uh, sex, yes, but not with different people. <laughs> so... Staying on the topic of your wild student years, <laughs> um, you studied in Tilburg, where you, did, yeah. where you got a degree in journalism, and afterwards you jumped straight into the field. And my question is, have you always wanted to become a journalist, as has been your dream? Yes. Yeah, actually, I'm uh, one of the lucky ones who knew very early on that um, I wanted to be a journalist, even though I didn't have uh, no comprehension of what it was exactly what I was going to do, or if it would be radio, television, or newspaper, but um, I was born in Limburg, and, uh, which I still love, the province, but it also felt like I couldn't wait to leave my hometown and, um, and have adventure and go into the world, and, and journalism is exactly that. If you're curious, and uh, you're persistent, and you like to travel, then there is no better job than to be a journalist. So I'm, I'm really happy, and I'm, uh, I've been doing it now for almost 40 years. And I still can't imagine an alternative that would suit me better. Mm. And speaking about journalism, you mentioned that you wanted to get away from Maastricht, which is, uh, you know, maybe a bit boring at times. But maybe if I was born in Maastricht, I uh, would still be there. I, I was actually born in the northern part of the province. Mm. And Maastricht is a, um, is a great city, very beautiful very relaxed, um, but Limburg, you know, Limburg is like the, the southern part of Italy, <laughs> and uh, people um, make fun here in Amsterdam about your accent and the fact that you're maybe a bit uh, mm. stupid or backward, like the Dutch say about the, the people in Belgium. Mm. Not that that wasn't the reason that I wanted to leave, but it's not the, the hip and happening place in the Netherlands. Because mm. eventually you did leave. At the age of 28, you became a war correspondent in Bosnia, which is quite a radical shift from what you did before. You were a radio host. What prompted you to make such a radical sh sh shift? Well, again, I, I wouldn't call myself a war correspondent because I consider a war correspondent somebody who does this all the time, who is a, mm -hmm. uh, this is the only thing they do. So, for example, on College Tour, we had the CNN war correspondent, Clarissa Ward, or Christian Amanpour in her days. Mm -hmm. Can you still hear me? Yes, uh, but, but for the, the program I worked for, which was the predecessor of uh, Newsuur, Nova, mm -hmm. they basically didn't have the budget to have something in a, in a war zone. But still, as mm -hmm. you said, I, I did travel a lot to, uh, during the war in Bosnia to Croatia and Bosnia. And um, the advantage there was, again, um, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, youth is waste on the young. This is about you guys. Mm. I didn't know exactly uh, uh, what, would be, what would be happening there. I, I knew I wanted to go there, but I had no idea of the risks and how dangerous it was. That's, that's something I found out during the first trips to Bosnia, that it was really 
scary, frightening, dangerous. Uh, but still, I wanted to get the story out. And, and once I was in there, I was hooked. Many people who... So you, I think you have two kinds of people who go into a war zone. The ones that go in there don't know what they are doing like I did and get very nervous and never return again. Or you get... It's like the adrenaline rush and you get hooked. Mm. And did you get hooked on this adrenaline rush when you went there? Yes, I did. Yeah. It's, it's uncomparable to anything that is happening here. I mean, uh, basically, a uh, war correspondent, the first problem is, and it's maybe one of the most difficult problems, is uh, logistics. So how do you get into a war zone? And this was really difficult in Sarajevo, where most of us were, because you could fly from Amsterdam to Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. From there, you took the car next to the Mediterranean to Split, and then there was a road that, that came increasingly difficult once you were heading for Sarajevo, where there was a mountain, Mount Igman, mm -hmm. and you had to uh, go down from this mountain into Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. And this was a, was a road that was being um, shot at by Serb, uh, Bosnian Serb snipers. So you could see while going down this road, the cars that were hit before you. And every day there would be cars and people dying there, so that was a tremendous problem to get into the city safe, especially if you didn't have a budget. So I had no flag jacket, no helmet, no, almost no money, mm -hmm. and no armored car. While everybody on the staff of CNN or NBC or the, the big guys, they, they all had that, but we didn't. But you still stuck with it nonetheless. So how did you kind of manage this experience, getting shot at, no budget, did you just stick with it because you felt you had to prove something, or did you <laughs> thought it was really worth investigating? Uh, the last one. It was really worth, worth investigating and getting the story out, because like most wars, in the beginning, people are interested, and then slowly it dies down, and interest goes somewhere else, like we are experiencing now. Two years of Ukraine-Russia, interest has almost faded, there is a war fatigue, and there is also, it sounds ridiculous and cynical, but there is war competition. So now it's Israel-Gaza. Yeah. And most uh, journalists are reporting on that, and the front pages are dominated by that story. And there was once a famous CNN um, reporter, Peter Arnett, who told in a group like this that people, audiences, have only the energy or the stomach, or how you would like to call it, for one conflict at a time. And two is just to too complicated, mm -hmm. especially when one of those conflicts is in Africa. So, for example, Rwanda, mm -hmm. the big genocide there, it could happen because there was no interest in the beginning at all for this conflict. And that's the reason why in a very short time, 800,000 people were killed. And it's not going to happen in Israel, Gaza, and it's not going to happen in Russia, Ukraine. But if you are in Africa, if you live in Somalia, basically you're fucked because there's no interest. Yeah. So on the subject of truly understanding such conflicts, in your book, Geluk or Happiness, you write that a top diplomat told you to really understand the conflict, mm -hmm. you should go to the US. Yes. Is that the only reason you wanted to go there? I didn't want to go in the beginning. So after my uh, experiences as a war correspondent, um, I was asked by the editor-in-chief of the program I worked for to be the correspondent in Washington, D.C., yeah. which is a, a job that everybody, let's say most people, are aiming for, and it's difficult to get. But I thought it would be very boring, because I knew Washington as a very boring city, and I wasn't particularly interested in, um, in politics at the time. Uh, American politics, now I am. Uh, but this guy has told me, and he was a very experienced diplomat, in order to understand what is going on here, go there. Because this is the center of decision and power, and everything that is happening here in this war zone is being decided over there. And he was totally right. And when I finally, when I arrived, and, um, and I, I understood American politics, I couldn't be more right, and it has helped me a lot to understand conflicts. So you would say that that sparked your interest in U.S. politics? Being there always sparks interest. So <laughs> if you are thinking about studying at this university and you have never been here, maybe you think, well, Leiden could be as, as good as, as the UvA, or I could go to another one. But if you research for yourself the university that you ended up 
in here. Maybe your decision uh, was based on the fact that you walked around here, you spoke to people, you invested the curriculum and, uh, and the professors. So my idea is always uh, there are nowadays many people who can write a book via Google, Google Books, is, uh, and have no experience whatsoever about the subject they are writing about. And my advice would always be go to learn your subject and uh, investigate your subject and travel and go to other countries to see what is going on. That's the best way to get the experience. Yeah, and you talk about speaking to people, and I think you started doing that more and more in the US. So one of the famous interviews there is Bill Clinton, Lindy England, who for those who don't know, was convicted for mistreating prisoners at the Abu Ghraib. Yes. Um, at first glance, reporting from the trenches, being shot at, seems to require a very different skill set than interviewing people in a more safe environment. How was that transition for you? Well, I don't know if, it, uh, if you need a different skill set, because uh, to do an interview like you're doing now, you have to prepare. If you're unprepared, the interviewee will notice and won't give you good answers or will be boring. So in order to do a good interview, again, you have to be curious. And it doesn't matter if this is, a, is in a war zone or um, in front of Congress building in Washington, D.C. You have to be interested in the other person and you have to get their story out. Because everybody, like everybody here, has a really good story. But you have to uncover it or you have to dive deep to get that story. And that's one of the first lessons I got in journalism from a guy who was a really good radio reporter. And he told me, you know, everybody has a good story. Go and find it. And, and he said, for example, I live in a street in Maastricht. And opposite my street, there is a cloister. Cloister? Is that the word? Yeah. That nuns Maastricht. are living there. And they had a vow to not speak to anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, he was so fascinated by the fact that people would go into this cloister, women, and not talk. So because it was his neighbors, he rang the doorbell and this little uh, wooden thing opens up and there is a gate and he has his microphone there, his radio microphone, and he says, well, hi, I am your neighbor and I know you are not supposed to talk to me, but could I ask you a couple of questions because I'm really interested? And by chance, the nun opens up and starts talking to him and he has a great interview. And now you're th I was thinking, wow, that's a, that's a perfect story and it illustrates the fact that everybody can have a good story if you have the right questions and sometimes it's your next door neighbor. So why did you want to transition to interviewing then? Because why did I? Why, why, why interviewing? Because you can get those stories out in the war zone as well. <laughs> my, uh, maybe my answer to that would be because my own life is really boring. <laughs> I like to speak to other people because if I know what I did this morning, so there's no surprise, and I know what I did last week. It's, it's not maybe the best answer, but I'm, I think life can get really boring, and that's the reason why I put myself in, in situations that are exciting. And now a war is the most exciting environment to operate in, and I wouldn't suggest it uh, to, to make your life business of it. It's really unhealthy and on many levels, but I learned a lot doing it for a couple of years. But now, I mean, being here, I could sit at home and uh, read a book, which I do as well, but I like to be also in a crowd, and uh, maybe I can put some questions to you guys and, and, and get there and get a good story there. Yeah. It's really entertaining and it's interesting. So about that crowd, um, as you see, this is a crowd of students. Uh, we are students. Uh, your program, Collegia Tour, uh, it's an audience comprised of students mostly. Yes. What is the mission behind that? Why do you think that's so important? When I came back as a correspondent from my um, period as a, as a correspondent in, the, in New York, so I started in Washington, then uh, New York, I came back, and I found it ridiculous that public television in the Netherlands had no uh, television programs for this generation. There was basically nothing, and uh, especially there were no, no uh, programs where uh, there was interaction between the, the interviewee or the, the maker of a program and the audience. So audiences, uh, mostly on television, are there to, be, to, to applaud the guests. So I, I suggested this idea, and luckily enough, the first guest, I don't know if you know him, uh, was the stand-up comedian uh, Hans Theeuwen. Mm. And he agreed to do a, um, 
a test show that would never be broadcasted. And my editor-in-chief, who said yes to this idea, he was in the hall at the University of Leiden. And when all was said and done, after one and a half hour, it was such a great interview, and the students were great, and there, was a, it was, there were very serious segments, because his friend, Theo van Gogh, was uh, murdered a couple of years before here in Amsterdam. And so it was very serious, it was very funny, he made fun of me and, and with the audience. <laughs> and afterwards, the editor-in-chief said, um, this is such a great test show, I've never seen a, a great, such a great test show before, we should broadcast this. But Hans Theo had said, I only cooperate when this will not be broadcasted. So we talked to him and um, finally he said yes, and this is the start of 15 years of college tour. And the fun about the show is that it's not scripted, so we as producers and I as the presenter, we do not know what the questions will be of the students. Again, which makes it very exciting and um, inspiring, inspiring to, to the guests, guests for me and, and for, for the students, students. and it has led to, to great um, questions. Sorry, uh, does that ever make you uncomfortable? Uh, um, yes, sometimes. <laughs> when? The student questions? Oh, not the questions, no. Um, no, the questions are mostly great. Maybe sometimes not to the point because somebody is nervous. You know, I mean, it, it takes a hell of a lot of courage to stand up in a crowd like this and ask a question. That's not an easy thing to do, especially if there are six cameras and you know it will be broadcasted. In the beginning, 15 years ago, it was difficult, more difficult for students to, um, to ask questions. Not, not anymore. I think you guys are not shy anymore. You dare to, to <laughs> go in there. But uh, there have been uncomfortable situations, yes, which is good. So before you said every, everyone here has a story, but I'm sure if everyone has a story, you still have to pick who am I going to interview. So what goes into the assessment of how do you make the choice to interview someone? Well, for a college tour, it's basically simple. Uh, we try to find guests that have 90% name recognition. And the reason for that is that we want to interview people that are on top of their game and who had good and bad times in their career. Because interestingly enough, you learn a lot from the failures. I mean, success is easy to talk about. Yeah, I had a number one book and my film was great. But what about the flop? I've learned that in those years. And uh, people who are really uh, good at what they do and are, and are interesting characters, they dare to speak about the failures. And that's when it gets very interesting. Mm -hmm. This is where, where I think you can learn. So building on this, when you invite a guest, I'm curious, to what extent are you interested in the guest? Or is it someone you think the audience might find interesting? Because you mentioned um, name recognition. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that? Well, I ideally both. Uh, and name recognition, it sounds a bit superficial. Uh, but when somebody is uh, one of the best in their league, either sports, politics, economy, arts, that so th those people, mostly they have a talent, especially if a career stretches on for, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, which is not to say that we had very young guests as well. Malala Yousafzai, yeah. uh, the girl who was 15, 16 years old when she was shot in the head in, in a bus uh, because she said and, and did what she did. She was very young, but at the same time, I've, I've rarely spoke to somebody who was so wise and so eloquent. But this is rare. So most of our people, most of our the guests, I would say, fifty plus probably, mm -hmm. um, and then, well, uh, if they open up and they mostly do, because if they come into a hall like this, it is fun to talk to students. Maybe not. They, maybe they don't like me as a journalist, not me personally. But mm -hmm. journalists are, for many politicians, for example, crappy people because they a nuisance. Yes. They want to find something that isn't correct or uh, um, somewhere where they stumbled. But, but you guys, not so much. Uh, you're new in the game. You're not sitting here as experienced journalists, but you are really interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led to a lot of answers and questions that I never could have done as a journalist, but that gave us great... Uh, television and interesting answers because of a question of a student. 
So I'm also sure that not all the interviews went according to plan, and maybe some of these you even regret. Looking back on your career, which interview do you think you regret the most? Um, regret, I don't know, but we had one of the interviews that didn't work was the interview with the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama uh, didn't talk to the students, but he only uh, gave a monologue. And for him, basically, it felt like questions were an interruption of his storyline. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't, was not my favorite, but still interesting because it uh, said something about him, but a lot about me. My biggest mistake in that interview was that I respected him too much. So you can never do a good interview if you uh, are in the position of a fan or if you respect somebody because somebody told you that you are interviewing God. And uh, the, the uh, people who surround the Dalai Lama will give you that impression. They will tell you, if he says yes to your interview request, please keep in mind that you are interviewing His Holiness. And I made the mistake of thinking that I was interviewing His Holiness, mm. which he is not. He's like you and me. Somebody decided that he is His Holiness, but he isn't. So if you just an old, old stubborn man also. <laughs> so if you could go back in time and you can go to your younger Tuan House and you could give him some advice, what would you say to yourself? To me or the Dalai Lama? To yourself. You can do both. Uh, <laughs> no, the Dalai Lama, I would never advise him because he's, somebody told me after the interview, he's the victim of the fact that somebody decided when he was five years old to put him on the throne. Yeah. And his whole life he has been um, treated like he was his holiness. So that he is forgiven because he is brainwashed by his own people. Anyway, uh, for me, my, my advice to me, um, I wouldn't say take as many risks as you can, but I would say take risks. Mm -hmm. Even if you think that there is a, maybe even a more than 50% possibility that you will fail, try. Okay. So don't, be, don't stay in the safe zone. You can always go to the safe zone when you're 70. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've made many risks during many interviews. Can you also tell me which interview really paid off, one where you're the most proud of? Um, ooh, it's so difficult to choose. because Well, first of all, College Tour is a collective interview effort. Mm -hmm. So as I said, often times, I'm really proud of uh, students addressing great questions and then getting the... Uh, so I'm more the facilitator in, um, uh, in college tours. So that, but that still, there are some great interviews that are still uh, being viewed or via social media have a second life. So, for example, uh, there is a great interview with uh, Whoopi Goldberg, who is a a dream candidate for an interview because she's very open and very easy to interview, very honest. And there was a guy in the hall, a student, and he said uh, he had a very long questions of which I and the editor-in-chief who's in my ear listening in the, uh, somewhere else uh, where the director is. She told me in my ear, listen, cut this guy off, he's very boring, go to the next question. And uh, I didn't dare to do it because I thought maybe there is something to it. But he started his question, hello, I'm, uh, I, I forgot his name, but I, I'm mildly autistic. And, um, uh, and that's why I joined a, um, a fan club of Star Trek. And in this fan club, and it went on and on, it took very long. And then he says, and, and uh, in this fan club, I was watching your show, Star Trek, and uh, I became a fan of yours. And because of you, I lost part of my autism uh, because wow. now I know how to deal with people and to communicate and it was because of this fan club and you and well basically I want to thank you for what you did to me. And then she stands up, uh, gets very emotional, walks into the hall and gives him the biggest hug ever. And uh, everybody was in, in tears. <laughs> I'd yeah. never experienced that before and it was a beautiful moment. I can imagine. That's lovely. Um, this is for us a time to look at audience questions. Pressure is on, you guys. Um, yeah, anyone? Just raise your hand. There's a question right there. Uh, the microphone is off. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Again, thanks for coming. Uh, I really love Collegia Tour. Um, this year, or this last election year, was the first time that Collegia Tour did um, a big debate. You were the first one. 
Um, how do you reflect on this? Because usually your position is to interview, and this time you actually had to moderate. Yes. Well, it was uh, one of the most exciting shows that we had uh, over those 15 years because normally a college tour is being taped. So we're not on the, on the rope where you can fall off. But this time it was live because the four candidates of the political parties, of which uh, three of the four are now trying to uh, get into a, a government that failed. Um, you cannot edit a political debate. It has to be live because otherwise the parties would be very... Uh, angry, why, why did you take out this or that? So, and it's difficult in a crowd with a thousand students at the Vrije Universiteit to moderate a thing like that because there is so much uh, at stake. Uh, so for me, to be the moderator was, um, uh, it wasn't that I had to come up with uh, super great questions because we knew that students were there who had uh, sent questions and we made a selection of the students because we didn't have, we only had 50 minutes. But it was actually, it was such an exciting evening evening for, for the audience at home. I don't know, have you seen it or? Yeah, uh, because the questions were again, these, uh, even though they were curated, the questions were great and it was the first time that you could see how these candidates would re respond to something that was unrehearsed. And, um, uh, so I loved it, and and we have been debating if we should do college tour more more often live, which is uh, difficult and risky, but I liked it. And and also interestingly enough, the first guest I asked for college tour 15 years ago was Geert Wilders, and he said uh, yes uh, when I asked him. And later on, in the years after, we asked him every year, and he, he said no. And this time, when we announced the lineup of this uh, debate. So we had uh, BBB, uh, Frans Timmermans, uh, GroenLinks, uh, PvdA, VVD, and NSC, Pieter Omzicht. And I think like two weeks before the debate, or three weeks before, uh, Geert Wilders uh, tweeted a message. Uh, PVV, Hater, Twan Huis, weigert mij uit te nodigen voor het debat van College Tour. Which was really funny, because we invited him for 15 years straight, and he didn't want to come, and now he wanted to be there. So we, we were thinking of, should I respond to that, that, that we invited him uh, every year, or just leave it at that and see it as a great announcement for the debate. And we did the letter, and, it, and that's exactly what it was. Still, I would love to have him as a guest on College Tour, yeah, yeah. especially now. Yes, I yeah. think it would be important. But it was a great evening. Sorry for the long answer, but it was, uh, it was fun. That's a great answer. Um, one more audience question before we move on again, or at the front here. Well, uh, indeed, thanks for coming. Uh, obviously, you're invited to this platform as like an expert in the field of interviewing, and that's why you're sitting on the other side now. I'm actually quite curious. Is there someone in your life or someone in the interviewing world that you still see as an inspiration or as an expert that you very much have respect for in the interviewing business? Uh, yes, there are many experts that where, where I'm jealous of the knowledge that they have or the show that they present. Uh, as I said, uh, Christian Amanpour is somebody we had on the show, and um, uh, she has been going on for such a long time. And her show, not that I watch it uh, every time that it's being broadcasted, but it, I see clips of interviews and uh, where I'm jealous there is that she basically can get anybody, almost anybody, on her program. And at the same time, she's still traveling. So, for example, last year in March, I was in Kiev, and there was a press conference of uh, President Zelensky, and uh, suddenly she sits behind me, and I, I, was, uh, I thought that was great, that she's still, besides anchoring from London, still traveling to keep fresh. So she's somebody that I uh, really like. And uh, walking to this um, session, I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts uh, for the last two years, The Rest is Politics. don't know if you have ever heard of it, too. Um, former British politicians, one is Rory Stewart, he's uh, from the Tory party, he was a minister in the cabinet, and uh, Alistair Campbell, he was the media guy of Tony Blair. And they have a podcast since two years, it's the number one in, uh, in England. And this Rory Stewart, he, he speaks like 10 languages, and he, I don't know if he has a photographic memory, but he does as they, what they call on this show, explainers. 
So, for example, shortly after October 7th, uh, the attack of Hamas on Israel, shortly after, he will do an explainer and explain to you in 13 minutes the, the roots of this conflict, which is a ridiculous thing to even try. But yeah. when you're done with him, if you listen to these 13 minutes, you'll be impressed because you learn so much. Uh, and that's what, there are so many people I learn from and that are still really inspirational to listen to or watch. You can never stop learning. That's the other thing. If you think you know it all, die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> so moving on a little bit from Collegia Tour, because I saw outside from hosting it, you are also uh, a host of Buitenhof, which yep. is a slightly short form, more news driven interview platform where you often talk to the people in charge, politicians. Since starting off as a radio host in Maastricht, how do you feel like your ability to hold politicians accountable has changed? Um, well, they are surrounded by a staff of people that take care of their message, naturally. And they will only come to, um, to a program if they think they can uh, win. So, um, still, in, I mean, I, I had a very short stint at, at trying to do a, a daily talk show, which was a failure. Um, and this one, Buitenhof, is a weekly talk show. One hour, one guest per interview, sometimes two, but mostly, mostly one. And that's a great format, I think, um, to get more interesting conversations than the daily talk shows that we have. Uh, but it's difficult. I mean, if you are a very tough interviewer, then it will be more difficult to get the guests that you really want to have. So, um, at the same time, politicians will look at your ratings, the impact of a program, and when they think both are good, then in the end they will decide to come to that program. At the same time, for example, uh, the now uh, demissionaire Prime Minister uh, Mark Rutte has not been on Buitenhof for almost three to four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is rare because I suppose if you would invite him, he would come here. And we don't know why this is. Um, but he's actually one of the few who has refused the last couple of years. And the rest of them, they will come. Yeah, so we had a question about this, um, which is not all politicians are created equal. Some are much better at evading criticism. And I think Mark Rutte, who's also known as Teflon Mark among some people, uh -huh. has been particularly good. Why do you think that is? Is it by not appearing on Buitenhof? Or is there other things there as well? No, no <laughs> that would be great. No, uh, why, do, why do I think he is good at um, not answering questions? Yeah, <laughs> what makes him so good? Yeah. Um, yeah, I must say, it's, it's a big talent. He's very talented uh, at that. Um, and, and I don't know if you can learn it. He, was, he has been one, one time guest on College Tour. This is a long time ago. And I found out that he had, a, as they all have, a, a media trainer, which he denied during the interview. And I told him, well, you have one. And he said, no, I never had a training. I said, I talked to your trainer, which I did. <laughs> and, he, and he still denied. So maybe that's one thing. You have to know to lie or not tell the truth or keep part of the truth behind. And then, I mean, he laughs a lot with the people that are interviewing him. And the automatic reaction is that they, that they also start laughing or, you know, you know how he does it, right? He, he walks to the Binnenhof, he has a cup of coffee, and says, hey, hello, hey, 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 how are you, blah, blah, blah. And he keeps on walking, so there's not a lot, a lot of time to, uh, to do a serious interview. Um, and maybe that's the reason why he doesn't show up in Buitenhof. I, I, it's really hard to say. The only thing I know, but this, is, this, this can be the reason that he doesn't want to come to Buitenhof, but in Collegia Tour we had an incident. It was actually a funny incident. As you maybe know, uh, the Prime Minister is, uh, has no relationship, is not married. And what happened during college tour is that one of the female students asked him as a joke, would you like to marry me? And I was completely um, floored by that question. I thought, what, what, huh? <laughs> why would you ask that question? 
And for him, it was the same, I think. And he, he looked at her and he thought, what, what, is, what the hell is going on here? So he said, no. And I thought, okay, next topic. And then behind the uh, female student, there's a guy standing up. And he asked the question, would you then like to marry me? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I totally missed the point. One of my colleagues later said, didn't you understand that he was asking him if he was gay? And I had, no, I didn't get that at all. But he got it. And afterwards, uh, a friend of mine who was actually teaching here at the uh, UVA University and had a good rapport with uh, Mark Rutte, uh, invited him for uh, a session like this without cameras for students who are doing their master's journalism. Mm -hmm. And one of the students asked him, what did you think of College Tour, and especially this segment? Yeah. And he said, um, his exact words, words were something like, it was close to over the line. It was close to unacceptable. Which gave me the idea that he thought that we set the whole thing up, which wasn't the case. But it was such a coincidence that one female male student had the, these questions. And maybe that's the reason why he thinks um, not a second time. I don't know. Have you spoken to him personally since this incident? Because how long ago was this? Yeah, well, actually, we have met afterwards, uh, like four years after. I, I don't know. Uh, you have to Google it, uh, Mark Rutte in College Tour. Uh, 2014? I, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But what the other thing that happened during College Tour, a lot of uh, great things happened. Uh, a friend of mine is best friends with a late-night host in the U.S., Seth Meyers, mm -hmm. yep. who also was a, uh, a guest of our show. And one of the tr things we had prepared was that Seth Meyers, who was famous for doing a stand-up comedy uh, act during the Correspondence Dinner. Uh, do you know the Correspondence Dinner in the U.S.? Yes. Yeah, 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 of course. President does a speech and a, a comedian. And uh, Seth had um, uh, ridiculed Donald Trump. And some people say because he ridiculed Donald Trump, that's the reason why he stepped into the presidential race. And I think that's true, actually. In any case, uh, we asked Seth Meyers to ask directly on camera Mark Rutte if he would be prepared to do a correspondence dinner in the Netherlands. And to our surprise, he said, absolutely, what a great idea, we'll do it. And it took us three to four years, I think, before we had set it up, but then he did it. So I spoke to him a couple of years later, but that wasn't an interview session. I just announced him on a stage here in uh, Amsterdam, and he did uh, his speech, but he d which uh, he did great. He was very talented <coughs> at it. Okay, so we've been really zooming in on Mark Rutte, which is yep. always fun. Uh, let's take a uh, step back and look at the broader political discourse in the Netherlands. Uh, as already mentioned with the audience questions, you, uh, mediate, you were moderator for the election debate. Do you see a trend, maybe a shift in the discourse itself that's becoming more polarised? Totally, yes. And it's coming, becoming so polarised now that the four parties trying to make a government, they are polarised amongst themselves. So now it gets really uh, difficult and, um, and a problem because they have to organize a government, especially with the news that maybe uh, Mark Rutte is leaving very soon as the Secretary General of NATO. So it, it's, for me, it's hard to imagine a government in the Netherlands, even if they are in waiting, demissionaire, uh, not in waiting, but, but not in charge anymore. But him leaving and all these ministers that already left and then this, um, this group of people who can't agree on anything till now, maybe they, in the end there will be a government. We hope. <laughs> well, there will <laughs> always be a government. Yeah. But it can take almost a year last time. So, and uh, there is not enough time, you know, with two wars go going on and the problems that we are facing. So it can be a shit show first class, which I don't hope. It's very bad for the country. But... A lot of things are coming together now that are completely new. And um, the people who are trying to make a government, uh, three out of four, maybe even four out of four of the old group, are uh, inexperienced. So that makes it very difficult. So the polarization uh, makes it even more complicated, especially if one of them is on Twitter all the time criticizing his uh, uh, competing parties or the parties mm -hmm. with which he has to form a government. And this is only politics. Now, outside there, I mean, anything can lead to a Twitter storm or uh, bad news on social media. And on the topic of polarization, we obviously have to mention America. But America doesn't really have a robust uh, public um, 
broadcasting agency like we do in the Netherlands. Here it's mainly funded by the government. Do you think that not being tied to economic interests makes you a more effective journalist? Um, well, first of all, public television in the Netherlands, I love the institution. I am a big fan of it, but it is not 100% public because 200 million euros are made every year with commercials on public television, radio, and internet. Um, so this, this makes the system diluted, so you could say, with mm. commercial incentives. So a program that doesn't score, that doesn't have a good rating, um, would be banned also from public television. It will take longer than commercial television, but it will not survive. Uh, that's number one. But I think it's a very good system that hopefully political parties don't interact. But as you know, they are. Uh, just mm. coming to this place, I watched the debate this morning about the fact that the first coalition um, adventure uh, didn't work out, and there was mm. a debate going on now in Parliament. And Geert Wilders uh, did point out again that he hates public television <laughs> and that he says that uh, we should take away uh, the funding and uh, it has nothing to do with freedom of speech or freedom of press in his mind. He says, I just hate that biased system because they are all liberals or desistic or whatever. Mm. So this is an interesting debate. Is he hurting free press when he is a... Um, uh, ambassador of getting rid of uh, public television and radio and internet, or not? Mm. That's that's the question that is now on the table, mm. and um, he he thinks not. And the other parties think uh, public television is important for a democratic system, yeah. which I think as well. Actually. Yeah. So what the other parties would say is that the Dutch public broadcasting agency is roughly fair and quite objective. Do you consider yourself an objective journalist? Well, or? first of all, uh, objectivity doesn't exist. It means it is impossible to, to stay impartial on everything. And um, as everybody is debating Israel-Gaza nowadays, I mean, it's a very hot and radioactive, dangerous topic. But as a journalist, you try to, you invite people and ask them questions about the topic. It's, it's not, a, I'm not a, a opinion leader. I'm not putting out my ideas there. But naturally, the selection of guests for Buitenhof, one could say that it's also very subjective. Because why last Sunday, not that it happened, but why did you have somebody on the show in Buitenhof uh, who is from Jewish descendant and lives in Amsterdam? And why didn't you have somebody from Palestine? Immediately you get into a difficult situation. Should you always ask both parties in your program, or isn't that necessary to be objective? So in, it's, it already starts with, it is very difficult to be objective all the time, and I think impossible. Is that the reason why you think such a large subset of the Dutch population seems to agree with Wilders when he says that... One in five. One in five? That's yes. a pretty big group, though. It's it is, it, and it's a growing. Uh, if you f believe in opinion polls, he would now have one in three. He said that in Parliament today as well. Listen, for me, it would be good to have elections because uh, the, according to opinion polls, he has now 47, 48 seats in uh, Parliament. Um, yes, I, I do think that, um, that there is a majority of people who are very critical also on uh, journalism in the broad sense of the word, and maybe public television specifically. At the same time, it never has been different. I mean, the, the nickname for journalism is not for nothing muckrakers. I mean, on the social level, journalists and uh, lawyers are at the same mm -hmm. level, which is very, very low. So you also always have to consider that as a journalist, you're uh, an instrument of getting the news to people, but you're not the politician. You're not the CEO of a company. It's a very humble service, I would say. But because we have this talking chatter class in the Netherlands uh, with uh, popular shows where people pretend that they are journalists, they are not. I mean, VE is not a group of journalists talking <laughs> about the, the daily news. It's, it's an entertainment show, but with a huge following. And it is very impactful. And at the same time, it's not only in happening in the Netherlands. You could see that the current affair shows and the news shows, they are losing audience. Um, so that's, that's something to, uh, to consider and to think about. 
So you mentioned before that Geert Wilders is basically saying, well, if you look at the media, it's liberal, left-wing. Public television, he said. Public television. Yes. It seems that you've managed to escape this, this box. Do you think that's a fair assessment? And you have to be more precise. I managed to escape the like box the of, a, of a journalist with an opinion. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, my, I have been trained as a journalist to not give my opinion. So I'd, I'd never ever said during my career uh, whom I voted for. Um, I would be very, it would be impossible, not impossible, but I would not like to sit here and, and tell you guys what to think of anything except one issue, climate change. And that's where I make um, the distinction. Uh, people who deny that problem, I don't have any uh, time for that anymore. So uh, Does even this opinion kind of put you in a box, you think? It could be, but that, that's then, that is not my problem. Because if you were to, let's say, look at the American media landscape, the moment you take one position like this, mm -hmm. uh, you instantly get put into a box. And I think the polarization is even more in America. Uh, if Fox News and CNN are looking at the same issue and then they do coverage on it, it seems like they're covering a different situation. Why do you think that the Netherlands has managed to escape this polarization? You mentioned that it's we on didn't, the run. We did, we did, and it's happening here as well. It's on the same level? Uh, maybe not, uh, well, in some cases we are uh, on the same level, yes. Look at the results of the elections. Uh, there are so many people in this country who don't believe in institutions anymore, and, and they don't believe in parliament or in politics. So that's a really serious problem, and one of the... Uh, I'm, I'm sure the feeding ground for that is social media. Mm. Uh, everybody has their own bubble, you know the story, and it makes it very difficult to get anything done in politics. And I wish Geert Wilders, if he will become the next prime minister of this country, a lot of success, because he will have the same problem then. Unless mm. you develop like uh, somebody like Donald Trump. And whatever he does, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, I've been extremely shocked by the fact after he said uh, grab him by the pussy that he could go on with his presidential campaign. Uh, this this week, week, it seems normal, but it's not. I mean, it, he's the first former president in the history of the United States who had sa has said, listen, Russia, if these people of NATO, the member states of NATO don't pay their bill, grab him by the pussy. <laughs> well, his <laughs> phrase was this time, mm. go invade them. Yes. And, and, and it's good to know that of all the member states of NATO, I think it's only, I'm not precisely sure, but Poland, the UK, Greece, and uh, uh, some other states at the um, east front of Europe are paying their fee that they have to pay more than 2%. We are not doing it, the Netherlands. Mm. So basically he said invade the Netherlands. And he's up mm. for election on the 4th of November, and he is um, in the opinion polls. Uh, Biden can't win today of Donald Trump. So, but in, in any case, I just wanted to say, talking about polarization, it doesn't harm him at all. If anything, it makes him more successful. So it mm -hmm. is also uh, apparently a, a way to have success in politics, to be extreme. On the extreme side is good for in this time of mm -hmm. change. So on this note, is there any more audience questions? I see quite a few. Um. Let's go, oh, the microphone is being, um, let's go to the right, maybe. I saw a question of Greg Rowe. So, more questions. Thank you, yes. uh, thank you Tom, for being here today. As a student um, specialized in Croatian, Bosnian, and Serbian languages, I would be interested to hear more about your time in Bosnia. And um, with tensions rising again, I would be interested in knowing, like, would you like to go back? to Bosnia, and if so, how would you prepare? Because you told us about the two ways preparing for going into a war and being a war journalist. So I would be interested in, interested in knowing how would you prepare for such a thing. Well, luckily for now, are, are you from uh, Bosnia or Serbia? Are you uh, I have family in Croatia. In Croatia, yeah. So for now, as you said, tensions are rising, but it's still quiet. There's no, nobody shooting at each other as in the 90s of the last century. So... Uh, yes, I would love to go back. I haven't been there in a long time, but I have um, people that I still know who, for example, uh, as refugees came to the Netherlands but went back to Sarajevo. And um, 
and for now how to prepare i would i would talk to the people that are living there and and call them and ask uh, how the situation is and uh, preferably not only um, people in sarajevo but in other areas as well to get a good grasp of the situation uh, yes it would be great to be back and i hope it stays quiet there. <laughs> okay perfect um so moving on uh, looking towards the future, we've been mainly talking about the past. What is something you're currently working on? I'm sure you have many projects. Uh, so Buitov is one of them. I'm uh, writing or I'm preparing for a new book I'm uh, writing. And um, hopefully soon we can announce a really interesting guest for a college tour. A very interesting guest. Can yes. you say the name or is that still...? Well, it, it, uh, we don't have the date yet, so we have a yes. Mm -hmm. um, and when we have the date, we will announce, but I advise all of you to come because he, he it's a he, uh, will be extremely interesting to talk to. Okay, so everyone note that down. Um, also, you mentioned that you were interested in teaching, you said. Yes. So could you tell me more about this? Yeah, funnily enough, just when I came in here, I got a, an email from one of your professors here that I talked to uh, in December. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine who is a, a, a director of a school in Amsterdam told me, listen, uh, you, have, uh, you have a lot of experience, and I think with age comes the obligation to... Um, everything you learn to, to pay it forward or to give it back to students and I thought that was a very good idea so I contacted this university because I'm living next door mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically offered my services if they are wanted um, mm -hmm. and now my problem is I, I am not an uh, academic I haven't got a P PhD so officially you can teach at a university if you are not qualified but um, we are still talking about it, so maybe that will happen. I'm sure we will be able to work something out, and I'm maybe seeing <laughs> some potential students for the future, maybe at the UVA. Um, in your book uh, that you write about happiness, in Dutch, over geluk, um, you write that bringing media gives you immense joy. Do you think, once you're outside of the media sphere, how will you pursue happiness? Because it's, it seems to be an endeavor you'll continue. Yeah. Well, I, I was just fascinated by happiness because it's such a difficult um, word to define. And what does it mean for me and for other people? And um, um, some people use ecstasy to, uh, <laughs> to find uh, happiness. I've never it's tried right? it. Yeah, how many of you tried it? Because a friend of mine just told me, you have to, you, you have to try it because it's just, uh, yeah, you agree? Yeah. I've always been a bit afraid of uh, anything but alcohol, which is stupid because alcohol is so much uh, worse for your health. So maybe I'm going to try that. But in this case, <laughs> um, uh, the reason why I was uh, fascinated by the, um, by the subject happiness is there was a philosopher in New York who wrote an op-ed article in the New York Times about a philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm -hmm. who was a miserable character who had five kids, four or five kids, and they all were sent to an orphanage. And he hated his, um, uh, his peers, as Voltaire, I think, was one of his enemies. Mm -hmm. But he came up with a great definition of happiness. And he described happiness in a very long way, but uh, if you, uh, the short version is he was in a rowing boat on a sunny day on the, a lake in Switzerland, Lake of Beale. You went there, didn't you? Yes, I went there. And he was just uh, laying on his back in the rowing boat, and it was drifting slowly on the lake. And he was watching the sky, blue sky, and suddenly his, all his tormented thoughts Vap vaporized and he felt a extreme form of happiness and um, the best feeling he ever had in his life so i thought okay i'm gonna go as you think to this island and do the same and it was a total disaster it was rainy like now and uh, <laughs> muddy and, and nothing that he described was happening there but that's what i what was my starting position to uh, research happiness this quote of uh, rousseau okay perfect so the future plans involve teaching an asset, so that's... Um, <laughs> maybe. Maybe, we don't yeah. know. We don't no, know. it's difficult to get into a university. It's, it's more <laughs> easier to get uh, ecstasy. Um, so wrapping up. <laughs> For more than a decade, you have been a very important voice in determining 
what kind of conversations are important to have and who are the people it's important to have them with. If you right now could have one conversation, what would it be about and who would it be with? And is it going to be the guest that you're going to announce soon? <laughs> <laughs> it's so difficult to give a good answer because there are so many, but um, what comes to mind is uh, after seeing Tucker Carlson doing um, the interview with Putin, I really would like to interview Putin. And we have tried, before the war started two years ago, uh, we sent invitations to uh, Putin and his Secretary of State. Um, and uh, Putin's office immediately said no, and the other one said yes, and then the war started. But after seeing the interview, it was fascinating to, to watch the interview, but there was nothing on Bucha, nothing on uh, Mariupol. Uh, you would have done a better job. Yeah, I, I, I was just, I'm <laughs> fascinated now what kind of contract uh, Tucker Carlson uh, had to sign to, to get this interview. Because clearly there were a lot of questions that he could have come up with that weren't asked. For example, the name of Donald Trump only was uttered, I think, once by Putin. And uh, Tucker Carlson had no questions about Trump. I mean, what would a victory of Trump mean for, for Russia and, and more specifically for Putin? So many questions there. But the Pope would be a good one as well. Uh, President Biden would be great. Mark Rutte would be interesting. Geert Wilders, uh, all politicians. So um, uh, now I forget her name. What's her name? Oh, Taylor Swift would be interesting. I mean, everybody is interesting, but those people are really very interesting. Before you, I, I don't know, it, my problem is always, and, and it's your, your setup, your show, so I should not Please intervene, go. but I always find it very difficult if there are questions in the hall during college tour to, to uh, leave them unanswered. So my director is always pissed because he says, hey, you promised to only take one hour and it is one and a half. And then I always say, yeah, but there were more questions. And I, I think people should not leave if they still have a question. So would you take a couple of more questions or is it... I mean, our editor-in-chief is maybe more scary, you know. Um, so, listen, so, so listen to him. Yes, I see. Uh, so, enthusiastic, yes. yes. So perfect. So, Guys, come on. Get the microphones out. Part of the room for dis discussions. Now there are quite a few Come points. on. Yes, great. Um, at the front, perfect. Thank you. Um, my question would be regarding uh, the consumption of media and how... For someone from uh, my generation, it can be quite overwhelming consuming all sorts of media and actually being served media on a platter by all sorts of mediums. And I'm wondering from a journalist perspective, how do you filter through all this overwhelming amount of information that's coming your way? And what would your advice be for someone, um, a student like me, yeah. how to filter through that news uh, overflow that we are getting right. every day. Well, first of all, this is not a generational matter. I have exactly the same. And um, I have, because of my work, quotes to all the um, uh, Dutch uh, newspapers and foreign newspapers, and it's just, it's too much. And especially when the news is so grim as it is the last couple of years, uh, for the first time in my career, it gets to me. It's, it's more than just a job. So, but I would uh, select, what I do is, um, I have a couple of uh, newspapers that I think are excellent or uh, well run, so I will digest those every day. And I keep away from social media, so um, Instagram maybe f a couple of minutes per day, but nothing too much. And Twitter, uh, it's a ridiculous platform where sometimes are really good uh, suggestions or interview bits or articles that I find interesting. But it's so easy to get in these algorithms uh, rhythms and, and, and don't stop anymore. So uh, limit yourself, choose wisely and limit yourself because otherwise you don't have a conversation with friends anymore, I think. So we're not gonna limit ourselves uh, here with audience questions. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, you already sort of answered my question, but I was wondering what you thought the intention of the Tucker Carlson interview was with Putin, considering he is a subjective journalist and how this interview plays in on the global arena. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a big win for Tucker Carlson and uh, Vladimir Putin because Tucker Carlson, as you know, uh, left Fox uh, half a year ago. 
And Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox, had to pay uh, 750 plus million because he was lying in his show. So he wasn't down and out, but, but basically he was down and out. And now he's not. And he came back with a vengeance. And whatever you think of the interview, but everybody has heard the name Tucker, Ca Tucker Carlson now. And 104, no, 170, 170 million people have watched it a couple of days ago, so it's way up. So he won, President Putin won, because even though the first half hour was a disaster or boring, but all the clips uh, with his agenda were broadcasted all over the world, and uh, New York Times um, uh, made it their opening, as many did. So um, great news for Tucker Carlson. But the underlying question I still have is, what was the deal? What was the deal he had with Putin and vice versa? And was there contact between Tucker Carlson and the media team of uh, Donald Trump? Uh, and I'm surprised till now that, that we haven't got anything on those questions. Okay. You, uh, this is so nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey. Thank you. Actually, at the same uh, line of question, I think what hasn't been mentioned about the interview is also the question of whether uh, Putin even should have the space to talk so much now. Um, if uh, there is also something about the underlying morality of having the interview, uh, I think the questions you are asking are super important, but you've expressed interest about interviewing Putin uh, yourself, which I think is very fair. On the other hand, yeah, I was wondering uh, what you think about the morality of the question if Putin should have um, so yeah, a lot of space in the media or any space in the yeah. media. Well, I think yes. The question is not, for me, it's not the question if you interview murderers or dictators or very bad people, if you get the chance to do a f uh, an interview independently from that person that has said yes to the interview, um, if they start demanding money for an interview or these questions can be raised, then that it's off limit. That, that for me, there the interview stops. But let's give the most extreme example. I think there has, uh, there isn't, uh, a famous interview with Adolf Hitler, but let's say he was uh, alive today. Would you, you have to ask yourself that question, would you, if you are a journalist, interview him or not? I think it would be interesting to get his views uh, through a journalist who is up to the task, who is prepared and willing to be very critical. And then it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, I have interviewed murderers, and it's not uh, the question if you uh, can interview them, mostly them, but how. And if there is a contract, if, if, if there is a secret arrangement that you and him or her have decided not to raise some questions, then it's a terrible shit show. But if not, and if you can do this, then it's great. I mean, and I would like to direct you to one of the journalists that I admired for a long time. Uh, Oriana Fallaci, an Italian uh, journalist who in her days could get access to the most terrible, interesting, fascinating people. And basically for a leader of a country like Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, they would invite her to do an interview. Because if you did an interview with Oriana Fallaci, it said something about your uh, position in the world. And she did it in a, in a tremendously good way and very critical, and she was never afraid. And that's the thing. You cannot be afraid. Going into uh, the Kremlin for this interview, it would be abnormal not to be afraid if you know that there is an American journalist from the Wall Street Journal already for 10 months in jail. So what are you going to do? Do you dare to raise every issue? Or are you afraid that you will be jailed after the interview? I mean, this is the most extreme thing that could happen. I don't believe it could happen, but it, everything can happen. So, yes, you can always go for terrible people to do the interview if you can do it independently. Okay. Can we do one final one? And then maybe if you have questions after, uh, if you're open to that, you can approach people that still absolutely one question because I don't want to I love more questions the big boss can go much. forever um, <laughs> <laughs> well the building closes at 10 I think yeah okay <laughs> <laughs>
final, this is guys, it's an opportunity. Um, there's many hands. I trust you, Saskia. Um, maybe it's a little less politic related. I wonder, uh, a couple of years ago, you want to interview uh, the agent of Satan Ibrahimovic, uh, Mino. Um, I wanted to interview whom? The Zaka Wanemer uh, from ah, Ibrahimovic. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's actually not me. <laughs> that's uh, the college tour had, had five episodes that were being anchored uh, by Matthijs van Nieuwkerk. Ah. Okay. And uh, so it was a kind of interbellum. Oh. I was at a commercial station then, and the show went on. And Matthijs van Nieuwkerk, uh, yes, he wanted to ah, okay. interview the agent of... Uh, yes, you're okay. right. Oh, so it's not you. Then I, I passed it to her. She had a question. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm a journalism master's student, and I had a journalistic question um, about what you said on not being a fan of the person you're interviewing. And I find that I find it very challenging to not put a respectable or an expert person that I'm interviewing on a pedestal, especially since I'm a starter journalist myself. So I wanted to ask you if you've developed any strategies to be a critical interviewer of people that you do look up to. If it's possible, you mean to do a critical interview with uh, somebody you look up to? Yes, and yes. how? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and uh, yes, you shouldn't, I, th I think, as I said before, if you look up to a, a person, then it's not a good idea to interview them, maybe. Maybe, yeah, I'm sure. So, I mean, everybody has their flaws. There is no perfect person. And, and if you dive into the career or the life, I'm not talking about personal things. I mean, personal life is something that uh, I wouldn't address that easily. In college too, we do actually, but uh, I'm not looking for dirt in, in the personal life of people. But uh, let's say on a professional level, even if you look up to somebody, uh, as a journalist, you can't. And you have to look for uh, also for the flaws, because, uh, again, uh, nobody is without them, and uh, you can learn from those. And hopefully the person that you are interviewing has something interesting to say about it. Um, to give you an example, I was listening to this debate this morning and what the opposition parties in parliament did was uh, asking Geert Wilders, where did you fail during setting up this uh, new coalition that, that's not going to happen? And uh, he was very good, he was very interesting, but basically he said constantly, I didn't fail, the other one failed. I didn't fail, he made the mistake. And then the members of opposition would say, well, you blame the other ones, but where is your part in this? And he said, well, maybe I did something, uh, but it's, it's not, not to mention that. And so he doesn't want to go there, but you have to get him on that spot. Because isolate the other ones. Okay, you have mentioned now where you want to put the blame. But what about you? No, there's nothing to blame. That, that can be true. You have been in this same group of people and you made mistakes. So uh, looking up to people, fine but leave it behind when you are going to interview them, because otherwise you won't get anywhere. What is an interview where you say, I love your work? <laughs> That's boring. Yeah. So for those of you, and I feel like we can wrap up now, uh, but this was great. Normally guests don't have time for this, so we appreciate <laughs> it. Um, so for all of you who are like, this interviewing business sounds quite fun, and it's room for discussions thing sounds good. Luckily for you, in applications are open. Right there is a QR code you can scan or just go for room, room for discussion. The website, we would love to have you apply. Um, maybe you can become the next one house, who knows? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and you will be sitting here. And beyond this, we will also be interviewing the CCO of Vattenfall, as many of you probably know, Cindy Crown, on the 1st of March. And the we will 29th of February. The 29th of February, excuse me. And on the 1st of March, we will discuss the upcoming European elections with Simon Hicks. Uh, so, <laughs> so thanks again, uh, thanks again, Tan, for coming. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.